Okay, so I'm gonna start um, by kicking off the event. So welcome everyone for our panel UX for Startups and Behind the Scene Look. We are very excited for you to be here with us uh, from Philadelphia, joining from Philadelphia. So we usually do uh, for, the, for whom who first time joining. We are Freddy Kais and we usually host um, UX event every month in person in Philadelphia. But then obviously it's in these situations, we are excited to, to broadcasting and host you and let people join you from all around the world. Um, in the uh, attendance list, we have seen people from like, um, from Europe, from Asia, from um, every in corner in, in, in the US. So we all really excited to see you all here. Um, for this specific event, we have three talented UX leader um, that we uh, we love. So Ha and Alex and um, Casey, we also shout out and let them share. I, I'm really excited to, let, to hear their stories and their uh, their knowledge about um, their um, experience in startups. We also want to shout out to um, John. Um, he will be our um, uh, panel coordinator today. So here's the thing uh, here all tonight look like. We're gonna start, so I just, we can start um, a little bit about the intros, about Philly Kai, um, the, then the event overview. We're gonna talk about uh, who we are. We'll talk about uh, our, our future event. Um, and then at 6.50, um, our panel we're gonna start. And after uh, roughly, um, I don't know what the math here, but like 7.45, we're gonna do a Q and A. So if you have any question for our panelists or we, you, you um, you want them to um, like to pre-assign a specific question to them. So let them know in your questions. Um, and so like um, in the Q and A chat in the Q and A um, windows, if you see um, any question that you feel related or you think is is you want to hear more, uh, you can vote on that questions and um, John can then pick that up right away um, in the Q and A. And then at the at eight o'clock. Um, we do a little bit raffle. We have our cute little base cap from Guru um, and uh, um, three books that we can send out. So please tag along. All right, I'm gonna hang out to um, Ben or um, strategist, um, content strategist. Uh, thank you, Chong. Uh, hi everybody, my name's Ben. I'm the brand and content strategist on the board this year and wanna give a an introduction to Philly Kai for anyone who might not know who we are or might need a reminder. Um, can we go to the next slide, Chong? Cool. Um, and actually, I think the next one has our mission and everything. Yeah, so this is a little bit about us. We've been hosting, or Philly Kai has been hosting meetup style educational and networking events for 15 years. We're dedicated to knowledge sharing and building a strong UX community for Philly. Um, we're proud to provide really consistent programming for the UXers here in Philadelphia and also this year um, even beyond Philadelphia for everyone who's joining around the country and the world. So we're, we're really glad to have you. Um, we're also committed to supporting a respectful environment uh, for professionals to gather and explore UX together. So if there's any unacceptable behavior, please let us know in the chat. You can also reach us by emailing phillykai at gmail.com or on social. All right, this is our board this year. Chong is our chair. Uh, Christine is the vice chair. Lorraine is treasurer. Michelle is the social media strategist. And that's me there at the end. Um, we're gonna have a lot of open board positions for next year. So if you have any interest, um, we'll be putting together a form, kind of a more an actual application form in the next few weeks, but please reach out to us if you have interest in the meantime, or if you have any questions, I'd love to have you on the board next year. All right, I'll pass it over to Lorraine. Hey everyone, um, my name is Lorraine and I'm the Philly Kai treasurer. I wanted to talk for a minute about our next event, which is gonna be in November for World Usability Day. The theme this year is human-centered AI. Um, if you are interested in actually presenting at this event, look out for our call for submissions. It's gonna be released in, in the coming weeks. And the event itself is probably gonna be around like mid-November. Okay, you can go to the next one. 
And for those of you who are joining Philly Chi for the, for the first time, we do what we call job time at every event, where we're trying to connect job seekers with companies that are hiring. Um, we are a local chapter. We're based in Philadelphia, so we are focusing on the Philadelphia area, despite even, even in the times of COVID. Um, so if you are um, part of a company that is hiring right now and has any open roles, feel free to drop a link to that in the chat if you, if you do have a link for, for that role. Also, if you would like to share anything about the role, feel free to raise your hand and I can unmute you so you can share a little bit about the role. So feel free to do that now if anyone has any open roles that they would like to share. Don't see anything, um, and that's okay. If you do have a link, you can share that in the chat. All right, and I'll hand it over to Christine. Awesome, next slide please, Chung. Awesome, thanks. Hi, I'm Christine Cuniff and I am the Billy Kai Vice Chair for 2020. So I'm going to introduce us to tonight's panel. Next slide, please. Our moderator tonight will be John Billet, Senior Director of Product Design at Guru. We also have Ha Fon, Director of Search Platform at Pluralsight. Alex Kipet, uh, Lead Product Designer at Guru and Kelsey Sadden, Director of UX and UI at Neuroflow. Awesome. So I want for us to walk through a few of the webinar logistics for tonight. Um, first off, you'll be muted by default and your video will be off. Please use chat for general discussions or comments. Use the Q&A feature to pose questions for our panelists. Um, to save time tonight, we won't be unmuting individuals one by one, um, but we will have some interaction in our, our chat and Q&A. Um, use the like feature to upvote the best questions uh, or the questions that you wanna hear the answers to so that they are more likely to be asked. Um, lastly, this event will be recorded and shared online. So please be mindful um, of your commentary and uh, how you how you are in this chat. Um, great, so I'm gonna hand things off to Michelle. Awesome, thanks Christine. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Michelle Colon and I am the social media strategist on the Philly Kai board this year. Um, so first of all, we wanted to give a huge shout out and a special thank you to our event sponsor, Guru. Um, as you can see, Guru is a knowledge management solution that delivers everything you need, spend less time searching and more time doing whatever it was you were actually hired to do. <laughs> and also uh, a big thank you to the rest of our annual sponsors, Think Company, Slalom, Vanguard, <clears throat> excuse me, Vanguard, Harrisburg University, Drexel College of Computing and Informatics and Rosenfeld Media. Next slide, awesome. Okay, um, and as Chong mentioned earlier, uh, please stay tuned for a chance to uh, win one of these three Rosenfeld books. The winners will be selected and announced at the end of the call and we'll be reaching out after the event to just gather all of your addresses so we can send you a physical copy of the book. Um, so that does it for me and I will pass it over to John to introduce the panel. Thank you, Michelle. So hello, everybody. I certainly miss the energy of, of a live audience for, for something like this, but hello, welcome. We're so thankful for, for you all to be here tonight um, to hear some great uh, commentary and ideas and discussions from some of these uh, excellent leaders in the, in the UX startup community that we have tonight. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is John Billet, um, and as was mentioned a couple of times, I lead the product design and UX team at Guru. We're, we're a startup company in Philly that creates SaaS software to help people be better at their jobs, uh, essentially. And in my 15 plus years experience in UX, the, the first half was more in agency corporate working environments for big pharma companies, professional sports, 
teams and, and also traditional ad agency environments where we had clients like TD Bank, Comcast and, and, and Visa. But then I've been fortunate enough to spend the second half of my career in startups. And at 39 years old, um, I have trouble imagining myself ever, ever going back. And I'm really excited for everyone to share their experience um, in startups today, especially to those of you who may not have experience in those environments or are interested in, in learning more about it. And I am going to fire up my screen share quickly to give you a little introduction and primer to some of the topics that we'll be discussing today. So one second, please. Cool, so hopefully everybody can see my screen. Startup, so if you haven't worked in one, what are some of the typical first things that come to mind that you think of? Uh, Silicon Valley, the geographical location, right? Um, a few dudes working out of a garage or a living room, long hours and high pressure hacking, foosball tables, um, and everything that you learn from Silicon Valley, the HBO series, because that's exactly how startups are, right? Um, well, not necessarily. It's tough to understand startup culture until you're in it. Do we work hard? Yes. Do we sleep under our desks every night though? Mm, not so much. Actually, a lot of startups have better work-life balance, diversity, and, and perks than their traditional corporate counterparts. And no, you don't have to live in Silicon Valley to work at a startup. Yes, Silicon Valley is where a lot of this culture and business model begin. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Google, Skype, Lyft, Uber, Joule, the list goes on and on. But today, places all over the world, and I apologize, I know we have people outside of the U.S. here, and, and I'm only showing the U.S. in, in this visual, but um, from, from Philly to Boston, from NYC to D.C., from Amsterdam to Australia, even from Chattanooga, Tennessee to Boulder, Colorado, um, these are some of the most thriving startup cities right now. So they're all over the place. It's not just a Silicon Valley thing anymore. And that means there's a lot more opportunities for, for people, especially in the UX roles, who are interested in getting into those. So personally, as I mentioned before, I love startups. They're scrappy, they're resourceful, they punch above their own weight. Uh, they're what I like to think of as the David to the corporate industry's Goliath. But instead of standing in the shadows, these startups are focused on forging their own new path, right? Solving an old problem in a new way, or even solving a brand new problem that's never been addressed before. They do a lot with a little. They try new things, they're open-minded, and they rarely say things like, we can't do that, or, or that's not my job. They also place a ton of value on team, creating the hardworking, vibrant culture that moves very, very quickly, probably more quickly than most of us are used to. And while moving quickly, they're measuring things and they're quick to change course when things aren't going as planned. And in the industry, it's a cl cliche term called the pivot. Um, a team then moves out of startup mode when they've centered themselves as a leader. When that nimble, scrappy, resourceful David becomes the new Goliath in the room with new Davids nipping away at their heels, that's when a startup has, has, has had that success. And one thing that's important to keep in mind is that not all startups are two to five person teams. They can range from single person in a garage indeed, but to hundreds of employees in a giant, beautifully designed and interactive office space. Oh, how I miss office spaces. Um, hopefully we'll be back there soon. But before we get started, I wanted to give a, a quick primer on the high level sizes and stages of startups that you may come across um, as you learn more about these industries and you'll hear about today. So very quickly, the, the smallest is gonna be seed capital accelerator stage. And this is less likely to include UX designers unless those UX designers are, are the founders. Um, in order to fund this size company, they use channels that, that have been relied on since childhood, such as small banks, friends, family, or your own personal funds. Um, this is literally the, the, you know, why they're called seeds. They're just an idea, and they're just trying to see if there's even a need in the market for this idea. The second size up that you would see is what they call the angel, angel invested angel. I can't even talk today. Bear with me here. I apologize. The angel investor funded round or otherwise sometimes known as uh, early venture. 
This is a lot of times where you'll, you'll hear the common UX team of one, depending on the product offering. Um, we have a couple of people on the team today who have been a UX team of one who will speak to that a little bit later. And at this stage, the business model is proven. Individuals um, are, are, their angel investors are individuals typically who spend their own money to fund a startup. And during this phase, the goal is to de-risk the question of whether or not the company should scale beyond the point that it's at right now. And then the next stage up is, is, is one of the more common ones. It's the venture capital financing or funding round. And in this round is where you'll hear things like Series A, Series B, Series C. Um, there are different stages of acquiring more money, sometimes from different investors. And this is when hyper growth comes in. At this stage, your startup has proven itself well. Multiple rounds of funding may happen and investors may also even join your organization to provide additional expertise. Um, series A is by far the most significant stage because it's during this stage that the company must complete a complex transition from a company with a great offering that could scale to a company with a great offering that is rapidly and predictably scaling. And this stage can go on for years and years and years and years. You may see series E and series F and series G. This is all really kind of up to the company in, in many times. And then at the very end is the IPO. This is when you're no longer a startup. You either go public or you're acquired by another company with more money. And this is when a startup becomes corporate. This is when that David becomes the Goliath. And so that's the introduction to startups. I'm really excited for today's panelists to share their perspectives and hopefully open up everyone's eyes a little bit more to the possibilities, benefits, and risks of, of joining a startup. I hope you all enjoyed today's session and walk away with some fantastic new learnings. And with that, I'm very excited to hand it off to the, uh, today's panelists and kick things off with some intros. So, Ha, why don't we start with you? Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Ha Fan. I, I'm super old. I've had uh, over 20 years of experience in UX. Uh, currently, I am the director of uh, Discovery Products. Basically, I work on, we work on uh, Search and Explore. We solve problems uh, like uh, search, uh, recommendations and browse, those types of things. We're mainly a data product. And I got to say that that experience has uh, given a total new perspective on UX altogether. I um, in the past, I've had um, a handful of UX experiences. Uh, I mean, sorry, uh, startup experiences. Um, I generally have started at the, what I call the startup cockroach or cockroach start, cockroach started, cockroach startups, uh, which is like that seed round um, I kind of like uh, to start at the bottom, the ground level, trying to figure out the, you know, what the right thing to build is. Um, so I've had experience working on two startup. One is like a um, a, uh, a platform for um, home improvement. And the other one was for um, Internet of Things, like uh, working with sensors and um, IoT. Uh, that was very close. Um, my last job before my current job was working for GoPro. I was the principal UX designer for Merchant Tech. And then um, now I'm uh, leading a team at Pluralsight and we work on, uh, we're a SaaS company working on um, e-learning for uh, tech professionals. Thanks so much, Ha. We're, uh, we're super grateful to have someone with your vast experience on, on the panel today and really look forward to, to what you have to share. Next up, uh, Kelsey, why don't you give yourself an introduction? Sure. So, hey, everyone. My name is Kelsey Stratton, and I am the director of UI UX at Neuroflow. Uh, Neuroflow is a digital health startup based out in Philly, um, focused on improving mental health through the use of technology. Uh, we are a B2B company, so we sell our technology to health practices, health plans, etc., who uh, then are able to provide our Neuroflow app as a resource to their patients and members. Uh, I joined Neuroflow team a little over two years ago now as the founding designer and uh, just fairly recently switched to focusing primarily on product, which was super exciting. Um, we are at about 55 employees now, whereas when I started, I believe I was the 11th or 12th employee or so. So uh, definitely a lot of growth in the past two years, which is uh, standard for a small-ish startup, but, but definitely always exciting times. 
I've worked for two additional startups in the past, uh, one of which is right in the city as well, uh, in Philadelphia as well, Sidecar, uh, which is actually where I met our panel coordinator, John. Uh, Sidecar is an e-commerce technology company. Uh, I was the second designer hired there. And the other startup I worked for was called Unilife, which was focused on um, healthcare devices, so syringes, injectable drug delivery systems and such, uh, located in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. And I was their first design hire as well. So while working as a startup can be hectic and absolutely crazy at times, um, I clearly enjoy it based on my, my background. I personally find it to be a really rewarding experience where you, know, you as the designer have a unique opportunity to, to really make a difference, uh, learn a ton, um, mostly on the fly, <laughs> and to truly put your mark on something. Thanks, Kelsey. Yep, we can certainly uh, be gluttons for punishment in in this industry. That's for sure. But one thing one thing that I know for certain is that the reward uh, at the end is always worth it. So thanks for that intro. And super excited to hear more from you today. And last but not least, um, Alex, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Thanks, John, and thank you to the the board for having me and and the other panelists for joining me today. Um, my name is Alexander Kippet, and I've uh, been lucky enough to spend the last 10 years working in startups. Um, I'm currently a lead product designer at Guru, which you got two descriptions of already, so I'll spare you a third. Uh, but specifically at Guru, I concentrate on our um, authoring experience around uh, any knowledge or internal knowledge creation. Um, so that's exactly where I'm kind of zoomed into. In the past, I've had the experience of working as a on teams as small as four or five people in the entire startup uh, to a, a stint at Comcast, where I was a member of a 250 person design team. Um, now at Guru, we're a nice little team of uh, six product designers and it's a you know rapidly growing company. So I like to think that that number will grow. Um, but those experiences have given me an, a nice balance of uh, opportunities over the year uh, to really kind of explore the different tracks within design. Thanks so much, Alex. Uh, great intros from everyone. Once again, super excited to, to get to hear some of your insights and, and knowledge um, today. And just to reiterate one last time before we get going, um, on the very bottom of your Zoom app, you'll see uh, functionality for not only the chat that a lot of us have been using thus far, but also the Q&A feature. Um, Use this to submit questions throughout this entire session, and we will have 15 minutes towards the end to address those questions or maybe even answer them asyn asynchronously um, while we're going on. So in regards to those questions, please limit those to topics that are relevant to the, the session topic, which is UX and startups. You can also upvote any questions that are posted by someone else in order to move them further up in the list and, and try to guarantee that we'll make sure to get to those. Um, it's very likely we'll not be able to get to answer every question. We apologize for that in advance, but our moderators or panels will do their best to, to answer those on the side. So um, without further ado, we can take it away and can get the panel going. And ha, we're gonna start with you um, this evening. And I mentioned earlier about some of the common myths or misunderstandings very briefly about startups. Are there specific ones that you would like to debunk for the audience today? And if so, what are those and what is the, the truth behind them? Yeah, I think the common story we hear all the time is like these, um, these high growth company with the hockey stick growth, um, the story about, you know, uh, Uber and, you know, and Pinterest or those kind of companies. Um, I think the one of the biggest myths about startups is that the success of a startup or how well they're funded is based on the quality of the idea. Um, when you talk to venture capitalists, uh, they will tell you that they actually invest on, in the team. Um, and so when you pitch your first initial idea, it's more like, you know, do you ask the right question? Do you size the market? It just those, you know, um, critical thinking and how you go about starting to frame your problem, but really they're looking at your track history, they're looking at your network um, and you know, how well the team balance. Um, so I think that's the biggest myth. You can kind of look at stories uh, that are already out there. For example, like if you look at um, the founders of Slack, they actually started building uh, a game uh, called Glitch. It's a multiplayer game and that game failed and they were um, trying to like 
they have to let everybody go. And at the end, they're trying to figure out like, what, what do they have here that could be a product? And they had already built a messaging app that um, they utilized internally. And that became um, you know, Slack. Um, another example for me that's very it's close to home is um, I used to work at this um, smart home uh, startup. And I, I joined the startup mainly not because I believe in the middle business model, but I just thought it'd be a fun time to play with the technology. Um, so somebody's like paying me to build these cool prototypes. And um, a lot of the machine learning uh, engineers on the team basically um, were doing experiments with sensors. They were doing experiments with gestures and, you know, like gesture UI. Um, and then that didn't go anywhere. So uh, everybody left. Well, a lot of those engineers went on to uh, build a company called uh, Uplift AI. And what that company does is it, um, you, you know, basically it can track the motions, you know, of, you know, when you're exercising and so on. And they apply that to, um, to uh, coaching or training. So they found a fit for the, uh, for the R&D uh, technology. And so I'm just saying that it takes a long time for you to find, you know, to do the R&D and to find the market fit. And you usually have to pivot a lot. So the idea that you first started out with is really the idea you land on. And so the, the investors are really investing in your, in, in, in your team and your skill set. Um, one other thing I want to mention is that I always use this example. Like uh, designers always think that you have a great product, uh, the product's going to succeed. I was like, use the example of Conquer. Every time I use Conquer, I want to kill myself. But but it's one of the most you know successful product because they have this this entrenchment uh, business model to retain their users. So um, that that's my example. I'll let others chime in if they have other comments. Yeah, those were those were great examples um, and, and really good examples of, of the pivots, too, that we talked about, especially with the Slack example. Uh, you never know where the idea is going to come from. It could come up when you when you least expect it. Um, in, in terms of that demystifying or debunking myths, what does anyone on the panel think about in terms of maybe UX designers who haven't spent time at a startup and they have this sort of idea in their mind of what it may be? what it may be, a fear, a concern, a bias, et cetera. Um, are there any particular ones that come to mind for the group to, to debunk here for this audience? Can I comment? I was thinking back of my experience and if I had to give myself advice uh, knowing what I know now, uh, I think it's like when you, when you decide you're gonna join a startup, uh, join because of the if your investment in the integrity and the talent of the other founders, not for anything else. Yeah, that's so true. I completely agree with that sentiment. <laughs> and if, yeah, and if I could chime in there, I think there's a perception that especially if you go into early stage or as a team of one, you need to have everything figured out. Um, but, you know, everyone in a startup is trying to figure it out. The founders have typically never founded a company before. Um, you know, you have engineers of all different uh, experience levels. So the idea that you need to have everything figured out ahead of time, I, I don't find to be true. You do need that adaptability and you need that desire to be able to get your hands dirty and really get in there and, and learn and grow. Um, but I, I don't think it's necessarily, you know, it can be intimidating to think about joining something and having that responsibility saddled on you. Um, but it can also be an opportunity to thrive and grow. Yeah, absolutely. That um, was actually exactly what I was going to mention. Um, you know, when I first joined the neural flow team, I didn't have any traditional UI UX uh, training. Um, I actually still don't. Uh, I came from a print design background. And so um, I was certainly very nervous to start a applying and interviewing for product roles, but that's something that startups can, can provide for uh, prospective employees. And it's, it's something that if you are invigorated and motivated by it, like don't, don't shy away and don't be afraid from it because uh, like Alex mentioned, no one has the answers. <laughs> um, and so just go in and uh, with that adaptable mindset and uh, be hungry for it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with all of that. Um, Alex and, and Kelsey, you touched on this as well. 
the the concept of remembering that everyone is also figuring out is figuring it out has always been really helpful for me and something that I think is great for for everyone to remind themselves of when they're coming in to this environment. Um, we're often focused on our, ourselves and we don't we don't know this and we have imposter syndrome and we may be nervous, but everybody from the 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 founders to the engineers to everybody that works at the company they're all figuring out it, it out as well we're all dealing with this um together and ha you made a a great point about the trust that you um should have in the founders or even the the investors and um when i've always noticed that when when joining startups this is something that i've done or i know that other people have done is to make sure that you talk to the founders. Even better, see if you could get time to interview with at least one person from the investment team. Learn why they invested in this company. Um, what was it about the company that made them wanna put their money um, into it? And what about the investors has them confident that this is something that they wanna lead and charge? So, so great answers um, across the board on that topic. Um, definitely lots of myths, unknowns, and uncertainties about, about joining a startup. So hopefully that um, shed some light on that for, for people here today who are looking to learn about that. So the next question and topic, we're going to move over and, and kick things off here with Alex. So as I had mentioned um, earlier, uh, I used my analogy of the David, David and Goliath of startups and, and enterprises. So on that topic of, of the differences between the two, I um, wanted to turn to you first, Alex, because you have experience in both these environments, um, being at companies like Comcast and then some of the other smaller teams that, that you've worked on and to being a guru now. How does a UX role in startups setting differ uh, the most from that of a corporate setting? What comes to mind for you first? And, and, and further on, what do you believe are the biggest benefits of startups versus corporate and maybe some of the biggest challenges as well? Yeah, um, well, there are a lot of ways I could take this um, and I could probably talk for way too long, um, but I'll try and keep it a little more succinct. I, I think when the greatest advantage is agility, which might be the answer you expect, right? Um, but I think that agility actually manifests itself in some really interesting ways. And most importantly to me is around how teams are created and how people are hired and how, you know, you, you form those relationships, right? So whereas a larger corporation, they may hire to a job description. I really feel that startups, especially in early stage and the growth stage, they have the opportunity where they can hire to the potential of the individual. And they can really, you know, craft their, the teams around them, craft that position to respond to the talents of the people that they have. Um, that's a lot harder to do in a large corporation. You know, it, it's a lot harder. You have a big ship, it's harder to steer it. Um, you know, within Guru, we have, uh, we work on a pod structure, which are interdisciplinary uh, teams within the organization, all with our own areas of concentration throughout the product. So that means that there are uh, designers and product managers and engineers all working together along with product marketing people. And, you know, kind of we come together and, you know, that's we're responsible for a, a given uh, area. My mind being the kind of authoring and, and uh, content creation um, uh, process within Guru. Um, but if you look at the relationships between those pods, they're all so wildly different. Um, each designer has such different responsibilities to the, the team in general. Um, and especially as we see the convergence between product and design, those relationships are ever evolving. So with that agility, it comes the ability to, you know, not only pivot in product and, and pivot in, in direction that the company might go, but to iterate on process and to iterate on workflows in a way that's much more difficult to do when you're entrenched with, you know, more corporate process, um, you know, and that takes on, it, it requires an experimental mindset. Um, and it requires you to kind of like wade into things when you might not know what's beneath the water. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think those are the greatest benefits. Um, but with that, you know, with that, with that uh, agility comes a bit of ambiguity. Um, and that means a little bit of discomfort. And that means, you know, you might not know what your job is going to look like in a couple months. 
Um, not to say that there's not security, but just in the way your role evolves. And I look back at the, the even the job I'm doing today, I've been a guru for a year and a half. The, the job and the role I have today is much different than it is was three months ago. And if I think about the job I was doing three years ago, it's almost unrecognizable to the job I'm doing today. Um, so I think that constant evolution and that ability to you know, keep rolling with it is really the greatest benefit. Hey, Alex, uh, that kind of really resonated with me. Uh, about a year ago, we were looking on my team for a product manager. And um, I opted to uh, recruit, you know, one of the engineers in my team to be the product manager. And basically, people asked me like, well, uh, he's not a typical product manager. And I said, well, there's no per such thing as a perfect product manager. They're just a perfect product manager for the team. So it's always that, you know, that balance. We work with people. We're not job descriptions. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Alex, you, you mentioned a little bit about the cross-functional nature um, in, in startups and how closely you may be working with different roles that are not designed that may be more closely than it would be in a corporate environment and how you just mentioned the, the product manager role as well. Um, I think that's a, a fascinating part of this discussion of not only like what UX is expected to do in a startup environment, but who UX is working closely with in a startup environment that's different than corporate. Um, so does anyone want to speak to that a little bit? And, and what are some things that somebody who's not familiar with the startup environment with uh, or the startup environment may see or in, in this environment where they get in terms of who they'll be working with? I'll take that on unless one of you have uh, wanted to do it. Um, I was telling my friend that it's very rare to see a startup recruit, the early stage startups recruit a product manager. Usually the product manager is the founder or, or members of the founding team. Um, and UX designers are required to carry that burden to be, you know, to help the team figure out like the market fit, um, to test, you know, validate solutions, things like that. So I think the maturity of the product changes the role of the UX designer. And then the, the maturity of the company also changed the role because the, the, the more the company grows, there seems to be, there's gonna be more structure, more accountability, uh, more ways that uh, the company has to measure you so that you can have a professional track, right? At a startup, you don't have a professional track. You're like, let's make sure we make money. Whereas like, when you join a larger company, you're like, I want to grow up to be so-and-so. So then, yeah, so I think that, that the responsibility of, of the US designer changes a lot based on the maturity of the product, the people on the team, and the maturity of the company. And to that point, I think, you know, as a, as a designer within a startup, it's important to understand that, you know, Typically, uh, you know, you're, uh, the, the need to solve real business problems and add to the value of the company is ever present. Um, there's not a lot of room for waste. You have to move strategically. You have to move swiftly. Um, and that means sometimes, you know, we as designers have, have certain ways of thinking about things and, and certain approaches to our methodologies. But that means sometimes we have to shift that perspective and open ourselves up and, you know, start thinking more as a product manager would or, you know, more as a product marketer would even thinking about how these things are communicated and how that we can really bring value to the customer and value to the company um, as one. Yeah, absolutely. And just one final point I was going to mention was um, as a designer at a startup, you will likely work with everyone. Um, as John mentioned earlier, it's rare to have a UX designer at, an, at a very early stage. And so during those uh, months that the, the company is, is being built up, the uh, CEO could be the designer. You know what I mean? So when you come in um, and now you're the designer, you're kind of taking that away from 
from people in a way. Um, some people are happy about it <laughs> and other people, you know, have a, have a bit of a hard time to let go. Um, and so it's, you, you will be co collaborating with lots and lots of people. Um, and I mean, I, I know on a daily basis, like I'll talk to uh, sales, customer success, support, my, uh, my, my new design team, um, and, you know, just uh, my product managers, the engineers, literally everyone. So uh, that's, that's my experience, at least with startups. Yeah, great point about um, typically when a designer, unless you're a part of the founding team, you'll come into to some semblance of a product that's already built, um, typically built by engineers or anybody who's not a designer. So one would say that we have a bit of a mess to clean up when, when we get in there. Um, very interesting times indeed. Um, there is one question that came in on Q&A that I think relates to this. So I could just throw that out this out there if anyone wants to, to hop in. And this is from Jessica Angeline. Kelsey and I know her from, from Sidecar. Uh, what is UX need from its collaborators, uh, engineers, product managers, or stakeholders um, in order to do their job well. So you talk about when we may be brought in, um, you know, obviously the company, the startup has decided that it's time to bring design in, but what do, what do we need from them? I, oh, sorry, Ha, go ahead. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll take it and pass it off. Um, I was just going to say, you know, uh, I, I think it's rare for people to, for designers to get clients, and in this case, it's our, our team or our clients in this in this manner, um, who actually know what they want and they can, you know, put a definitive finger on it. Um, so I think as long as uh, the individuals you're collaborating with are a open to collaborating, <laughs> um, because some people just, you know, like to say. It, like it to be their way no matter what. Um, but if you can get them to collaborate, to be able to initiate feedback and be able to um, be open to that feedback, I think that's super important. Um, I know sometimes I'll, I'll design an experience and I'm like, this is amazing. And then I'll hand it off to my front end dev. And he's like, what about these couple of things? I'm like, thank God for you, you know? <laughs> um, and so I, I think uh, just as long as everybody is is kind of in that mindset where it's like, this is a team thing. Um, that's what I, I really appreciate. Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, it's, it's the crux of all problems, isn't it? Um, so I think, I think in terms of what UX needs from their collaborators, you can say this across the board, um, but I, I appreciate about my collaborators is when they provide a diverse point of view. Um, when they can, when they can show me uh, where I might be wrong, or they can reveal to me the unknown unknowns. Um, so how do you, how do you facilitate a conversation where that comes up? Um, and sometimes they don't know what the unknown unknowns are, which is like the impasse feasibility. So you gotta, you gotta figure out like what the exercise to engage them in, so that they could reveal the unknown unknown. So, so example I, I provide is we do a lot of prototyping on my team. And uh, Travis was actually one of my key, key prototypers. And we were trying to attack this problem. And I was asking the other engineers if they wanted to, to prototype. And I think Travis told me the story of like other engineers saying, well, what does she want us to do? And Travis says, she just wants us to have fun. <laughs> And so I thought that was pretty awesome where a lot of people can not handle that level of ambiguity. But as soon as the engineers start to prototype, they, they could articulate different questions that they hadn't considered before. So I think just having that initial dialogue, uh, you can de-risk your assumptions, you can articulate better questions, uh, and you can more importantly achieve a shared context of the problem. Yeah. Great answers. Um, lots of differences between startups and, and the corporate environment. And I believe we, you know, we hit some really good ones there, but uh, also really only scratched the surface. And you know, a couple of you mentioned ambiguity, um, having fun and sort of just getting asked by, by your team, like, what do you need to get things done? Uh, Open-minded, lean, um, not constricted to using certain tools. 
And uh, it's all about making sure that people have what they need to be successful um, oftentimes. And a little fun fact about me, there was a, there was a job that doesn't even make it onto my resume that was in between my last, uh, the last startup and the one that I'm at right now. Um, I left startup world to go to back to corporate world. It felt like the right thing to do. And as soon as I got in there, um, I got my new MacBook and I set it up and it came installed with Safari, but I wanted Chrome. And I asked my manager, could I get Chrome on here? And his response was, yeah, you have to fill out this IT ticket um, and they'll usually get back to you within seven days. And I had to wait seven days to get Chrome installed on my MacBook. And there was no Slack and it was only email. And we had to respond via long email chains I knew in days that I had made a mistake. And I found myself back in startup land um, in no time. That was to me was one of the, the biggest perks. So moving on to the, the, the next topic, um, Kelsey, this one's, this one's for you. And we actually have a, a, a question in the queue that kind of alludes to this. So this may or may not um, kind of answer what that, that person was looking for. So I mentioned this earlier in the introduction, but a, a UX team of one is a, is a term or a role that we hear often from UX designers in, in early stage startup setting, um, along with maybe that will come with the job description of wearing multiple hats. And, and Kelsey, for the first few years at Neuroflow, uh, you've worn the UX team, team of one badge, which is a badge of honor um, in, in many cases. What does the day, your day look like as a team of one? And how do you balance the responsibilities of a UX designer, UI designer, graphic designer, UX researcher, project manager, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and any advice you would give to a designer who may find themselves in this situation for the first time? Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, it can definitely be tough sometimes. Um, it's a lot of juggling, requires a ton of organization, stress management, and um, honestly being kind to yourself. Um, I found that while it helps me to take a look at the big picture, I ultimately uh, need to break up my to-do list into digestible smaller chunks. And then that way I can concentrate on smaller pieces at a time rather than allowing myself to get swallowed up and overwhelmed because it's certainly very easy to do that when you're uh, flying solo. Um, I also try to make sure that I allocate myself time to design, time to uh, learn and, and better my skills, and time to document and organize everything. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I have to accept the fact that sometimes it's just literally not possible to get everything done. Um, and, and learning to come to accept that was a journey in and of itself. Um, but that's when communication and transparency with your team are especially key, in my opinion. And I'm very lucky to have a, a very supportive boss um, and a very supportive team in general. And uh, I also think that it's really imperative to remember that in a similar position to mine, I would suggest not letting perfect get in the way of pushing out your designs. Um, at a startup, sometimes time is of the essence. Uh, well, it's usually of the essence rather, and uh, you really have to be scrappy. And as such, you know, learning to let go of the pixel perfect mentality was really a huge relief for me. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, like I'd still love for my designs to be pixel perfect and built to absolute perfection, uh, but I don't want to let that get in the way of my designs getting out into the hands of our users. Um, so yeah, that I think that's at a high level, but I'm happy to dig in deeper on anything. To add to that, uh, a lot of the things you mentioned about, uh, you know, fast over perfect. When I was at a startup, I, that, you know, things were moving really quickly, and I was thinking about very complex problems. I didn't have time to like, uh, you know, just to communicate what I was thinking. So uh, I used to, we used to buy these shower boards because they were cheaper than whiteboards, and then put them on all over the walls, and for that twelve bucks a piece. Um, so we had to, so what I actually did was I filled the entire wall with like, uh, with whiteboarding my uh, thinking, like the flow and everything like that. And I would put questions there and I would leave it there for like two weeks. And then sometimes the engineers would go up and look at it and they would write their questions or draw additional things. And, you know, then we would, after a certain amount of time you know, passed, I would like reconvene. And then sometimes I would, those we replace with, you know, some of them would be placed with real, real wireframes that are, are really specific. 
so that saves me time having to document everything when it's not you know, like clear yet, you know, so other people are helping me and, you know, un unravel the knots uh, of ambiguity. Yeah, that team support is where it's at. And adding to that, I mean, the sooner you get that buy-in, the sooner you get that collaboration, the easier it is to move that process along. And then you're not left selling ideas that people are foreign to or unfamiliar with. Um, so it does streamline the process on the back end. Yeah, that's a really great point. You find yourself now having to have potentially have conversations about design with non designers who may have a varying uh, range of experience even talking about those topics um, and certainly find it find it to be challenging. Um, does anyone want to talk about maybe something that you you miss the most about not having another designer on on the team uh, while you were a, a team of one? What was kind of a, a pain yes. point that sticks out? Maybe how did you overcome that if you did? Yes. So I uh, was a team of one um, up until I think last month when I hired Nathan full time. Hey, Nathan. Um, and it was just like, it was so refreshing to be able to complain about some sort of, you know, like design related problem that no one would understand the terminology or whatever. And, you know, he slacked me the other day and he was like, I don't know who else to say this to, but like, I can't stand the iPhone just came out and they won't give you chargers. And, you know, and it's like, it's fun to be able to, um, you know, kind of talk shop with people who can relate. So I, I really miss that. And then in a, a similar vein, being able to brainstorm with someone who um, is like-minded, but also brings their own perspective. Um, because I was able to do that with, you know, my, my product manager and whatnot, but it is a different thing when you're speaking to a designer who is literally in sketch, like is using the design library, can help you, um, you know, kind of climb out of your, your own personal box and be like, why did you do it this way? Like, did you think about this? Like, oh yeah, no, I didn't because I just didn't have time to breathe in the past two years. So it, I, I really do uh, love having that collaboration piece. Yeah, similar. I find that when I talk to non-designers, just brainstorming, um, the designer automatically, like we as designers take for granted that we have interaction patterns already encoded in our brain. Like we have patterns of information architecture in our brain. We're already organizing it. We see the job in terms of mental models and system models already. So when I talk to my designer, I could say like, hey, are you betting on that pattern? And he knows what I'm talking about. Uh, if I bring it up to engineers or product, my other product manager, they would like, what the hell is she talking about? So sometimes like, because I have a design background, I feel like I have a shorthand to talk to my designer versus like uh, with you know other people. Does anyone have an experience to share as a design team of one where, you know, we talked about wearing multiple hats where you had to put on a hat that was not the designer hat, um, something that you wouldn't have had to typically do before? I have a lot of those stories. So I was, uh, I went to look at office space and it was like this warehouse with my, at the time, CPO. He went and he was wearing like, ugly ratted out shorts and he's really big and I'm really small. We look like this horrible house hunter couple, oddest couple looking for a, you know, rundown office space that we could rent for the team. And the guy at the, <laughs> the, the, the guy was showing us the property said, you know, you have to put like, you know, three times the, the rent for, you know, in order to get this space. And he's like, would 6 million do? Like, because that was what we had to, for uh, investment at the time. Um, I also had to, um, one of the most memorable but educational things I did was I went on a fundraising tour with the C CEO. So uh, we would, we didn't have anything yet. So I just kind of built th different stories about, you know, what the vision of the product is. Uh, ultimately it didn't become that product, but whatever. Um, so I would, you know, we would go to Silicon Valley and we had all these contacts 
And he would, before we meet with the person, he goes, okay, this guy is the lawyer from Facebook. So you don't want to show him this. You really want to show this. And so I would just like on the fly, change the presentation, just only focus on certain slides, you know? So it was super educational. And uh, I carry that with me to this day. Uh, can't stand a CEO now, but that was a great experience. <laughs> I, uh... <clears throat> In, in the first SARP I worked for, I ended up uh, running our trade show circuit. So I was traveling to LA and Chicago and Baltimore and hiring people when I got on site to help me staff booths and run events and set up things. Um, and that is not something design school really uh, prepares you for, um, but it does kind of give you the, the tools in terms of like design thinking and problem solving and, and just like figuring it out. Um, but you know that's uh, that's not something I'm looking to revisit, John. So let's keep that out of my job description. Yeah, right. I uh, had joined several um, sales uh, in-person meetings, which was definitely out of my comfort zone. Uh, we left there with the the sales associate saying, "Like you should really get into it." I was like, "Oh God!" I was like, "That was I don't think I breathe the entire time." You know, I was I was terrified. Um, so definitely, you know, trying to help in, su in support in that regard. And that kind of was more as the product voice rather than, you know, the designer. No one cared about the design necessarily, especially in healthcare, not always a, a selling point for doctors. Um, and the other thing is content creation. You know, Nathan and I still tackle uh, copywriting, which is like not our forte um, <laughs> per se, but you know, you got to do what you got to do. And when I had first joined um, my, uh, she's now the VP of product, she and I uh, worked together on creating an entire content module um, to push out for mothers to be on postpartum and, you know, other OBGYN goodies, uh, which was fascinating and terrifying. Um, but, you know, I learned a lot. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was definitely something I, I don't think that I would have gotten to do in, in a different capacity. Yeah, all examples of, of experiences that are, are very educational and, and life changing, but can tend to be really nerve wracking when they when they first hop in. We talked about the imposter syndrome earlier and, and that can come into play. But just again, another reminder that nobody else knows what they're doing either. And they're all doing things that they're not supposed to do and um, gives us the confidence to, to do what we want. And, and Kelsey, I think the one that you just said, uh, copywriting is, is just so classic. And, and that's a great example of something that uh, a role, a specialized role that may not get hired at a company for a very, very, very long time. Um, somebody who's an expert writer, which is unfortunate because I think all of us kind of really understand the the impact and the the ROI of really good writing. Um, but often something that designers will find themselves with or something that somebody else finds a responsibility with and designers will be very critical of it. Um, that's just the nature of, <laughs> of, of what we do, right? And you also mentioned... Uh, which was a great example of that, like how things don't need to be perfect um, be, be, before they, they go out, which is a big change. One of the things that I remember feeling the most about moving to a startup environment, you know, coming from a traditional environment, when you sent that billboard to print that was going to be on, on I-95, there better not be any errors in it and it better be, better be perfect. Um, but in the startup world, while it may be unsettling, to put out something that's not pixel perfect, I think one of the more settling parts of it is that you can always come come back to it, um, ideally. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't ideally. happen. <laughs> ideally, you get back to it and make improvements based off of um, what you learned. And I think somebody had just mentioned in the chat, sadly, UX writers often are never hired. Um, and yeah, the, certainly, certainly felt that before and seen that. Um, I think there's a, a really strong case to be made there that um, they could be bringing a lot more impact to teams for sure. Okay, so th those were some great uh, conversations and answers around uh, the UX team of one and, and how, how that's different and unique. And ha, we're going to move to you with this next topic. And this is where we want to spend some time speaking to UX designers who are currently in a corporate job setting who may be interested in seeking a career path change to that of being in startups. What advice do you have for them 
Are there specific skills, requirements, or expectations of them that will be different than what they may be used to? And, you know, especially thinking along the lines of things like the interview processes, the mental prep, the portfolio prep, transferable skills, or even attractive traits to include on, on resumes. But yeah, what advice for those looking to get in, into this world and how do they need to prepare? I think the number one thing that uh, people want to join startups should have is that they need to have hunger and they need to be scrappy. Um, all the other stuff you kind of learn. I mean, I'll, I'll touch upon the, the skills, but I feel like it's really, really hard. So you have to really want it. You have to believe in it. You have to, um, most of the time you don't have enough resources. You got to figure out a way. Um, so if you don't have that, then you can't get up every morning and do it. Um, the other thing is that I kind of want to step back and look at the kinds of problems that startups uh, solve versus the problems that corporate larger companies solve. So startups, uh, my experience has generally been C to Series A and maybe Series B a little bit, but I don't really consider Series B startup mainly because it just feels the same as my other jobs. Um, so I think at that level, the kind of skills that you're looking for, if you're trying to prove market fit and you're trying to prove value versus like when you're a larger company, the problem you're solving is like scaling and growth. Um, so interaction design to me is stable, table stake. Like I just expect people to do that well. I don't even feel like I need to like uh, drill you on it. You just gotta do it well. Um, and then the other kinds of skills I think are really valuable is really uh, research. You you may not have the time to do the research or resources, but you got to think like a researcher so that you can say, this is the tr trade-off. This is what we're going to, you know, this is basically the hypothesis or assumption behind what you're doing. Um, I think one really, really important skill is facilitation uh, because you're a UX you're a team of one. So you might like Kelsey and Alex uh, said that, you know, you might come into a company that already has stuff built. So you gotta be able to re-articulate the, uh, the hypothesis or the assumption of that existing product. And then you gotta be able to, to from that as a baseline, you gotta be able to get the team, you know, basically the team is making the bet. So if you can facilitate and get the team to articulate the goals, what success means, um, so that you can have a shared context about what problem you're solving. That's really, really important. But I think, unfortunately, a lot of times startups hire younger designers. And what I think is actually you need more mature designers in a startup because it's just one of them. So they got to carry the burden, right? They got to make sure people are asking the questions about uh, user-centered design. Um, so I think those those kind of skills that, you know, in terms of validating the market fit, validating solution is really important. Um, and then on the other side, when you think about scale and growth, a lot of startup, a lot of the skills are more about like working across other teams. Um, now you're building a platform, you have to have soft skills, uh, you need leadership. Uh, doesn't mean that you become a manager, but you're, you lead, you're a thought leader you know how to drive an initiative. Um, you, you, you think about governance in terms of design patterns, things like that. Uh, so when you think about startups and then larger company through those lens, you can kind of say, okay, where, where's the product at, maturity of the product at in the startup here and how do I add value, make an impact there? So yeah, so it's helped me think about it that way. Ha, uh, can you go into a little bit more detail about something that you had mentioned about hiring junior versus senior? And you had mentioned that obviously there's benefits to a small startup hiring somebody senior. They could come in and hit the ground running in, in, in different ways and have some of the experience under their belts. But what advice would you have for, for junior um, UX designers who are looking to get in, into this world given, given that thought that you had? Um, I had, I had hired, uh, junior designers before, and I think it's like, you don't know what you don't know. So if, if the startup, if a startup hires a junior designer, 
what normally happens is that somebody will drive the vision. Some one of the founders will drive the vision and you become the person who implements that vision. So, uh, so I had a junior designer before and she's like, well, how do I drive the vision, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, you know, you watch Karate Kid, you gotta wax on, wax off first, and then you kind of know why you do it. Uh, so I said, just keep, you know, keep doing what you're doing, but then ask the questions of why you're doing it. Uh, if, so if you, you kind of like each thing you're doing, you keep asking like, what's the assumption here? Why are we doing this? What does success mean? So then they can kind of like shift from implementation to kind of thinking uh, skills. So uh, if you can get a gig at a startup, you know, uh, it's great experience, like for anyone, everyone should have startup experience. Um, but it doesn't mean that, you know, you can't make an impact. You can make an impact tactically, uh, but you can grow into the other roles. And while we have you, Ha, there's, there's one more part that I took note of um, that you mentioned. You said it's important that you need to think like a researcher. Can you, can you share what that means a little bit more? So for me, once I figured this out, I just felt like it uh, solved 90% of the problems for me in working with other people. Um, so the problem is sometimes I feel like as designers, we intuitively know uh, how to bring things together. We just know. But, you know, other people have biases because, you know, they see the competitors having this or that. And I think that uh, thinking like a researcher is looking at a solution and being able to dissect the behavior behind that solution to say this core behavior is driving this output, this outcome. And when you can articulate that way, when somebody presents you a solution, you can step back and say, so the assumptions here are this and the hypothesis is this. So so the trade-off really when you're pitching this thing to me is you know you're saying the user would do rather do this over this so when you pitch it that way it's no longer about you me being right it's just like what, what are we trying to test and what are we betting on uh if you're okay with that assumption then you know if you're you get paid more than me and you're okay with that assumption i just want you to know that it is an assumption and we're going to track it to make sure that the assumption is true so once i realized how to unravel or, or, you know, deconstruct any design based on research question, then everything else became easy for me. That is a really good point. <laughs> um, and, and it really helps when you're communicating um, with all people to kind of like take that, that step back and look at it, like what Ha just mentioned, um, because it, it kind of uh, removes the ego from the discussion and so therefore, you know, um, sometimes people can get very passionate and obviously, hopefully you're passionate about what you're doing. And uh, if you can kind of take that step back and be like these, like just boil it down to the hypotheses and the assumptions, like then it feels much less personal, like ego's not involved and you can actually get to the, the crux of the issue. Alex, what may be something um you know on that same topic about what advice would you give to somebody who has experience in a corporate environment moving into startup what's maybe something that you would encourage somebody from a from coming from a corporate environment to to leave behind um or or not expect to have be part of their interview process or workflow coming into a startup environment sorry for putting you on the spot <laughs> no that's good um hey Part of the, I think, you know, one is the ego, right? And, and that's like being able to leave that behind. And, and touching on the point that uh, Kelsey Ta just made, like not entering into anything with the, or any research with the purpose of trying to prove yourself, right? You should enter into any research with a hypothesis, of course, that's good scientific method, um, but you're really not trying to validate your own ideas you're trying to validate the solution. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the hippos, uh, highest paid people's opinion or whatever that acronym is, oh, yeah, you know, right. um, which is like, you know, and that's a, that's an unfortunate side effect of a, a corporate ladder. You know, that's, you know, you level up, you level up, you level up, you, 
if you're on the design side, you're on the agency side, you have an associate creative director or a creative director, and it you know goes right up the ladder. Um, you know, that I find there's no real room for that in startups. And so when you can enter into that with a uh, kind of responsible and uh, eager way of doing research, um, you remove the ego and, uh, you know, again, realizing that you have to tie everything back to bringing value to the business, right? I've seen a lot of questions come in on in the Q&A. It's like, how do you validate your designs? How do you like, prove the value of design. Why well, would question, why are you trying to prove the value of design? Because that kind of almost implies that you, you're you not engaged with the business and you're not being aware of the business goals. So why are you working on that product or problem if it's not going to directly benefit the company, right? Um, so I think it's just, you need to have a little bit more aggressive way of thinking about things, a little bit more openness towards uh, being wrong, um, a little bit more experimental mindset um, and uh, kind of forget about the hippos and just like be true to yourself and, and do the job that you're there to do, which is to bring value to the user, to bring value to the company and to help your, your team succeed. Very, very well said. Um, love the point that you you made. Uh, you know, sort of responding to the question that's the top one on our our Q and A list, um, which is probably like a good segue um, into this. And you mentioned, you know, why why are you having to sell the value of design? Why is that how you're you're spending your time? And um, you know, one recommendation that I put out there there's a there's a ebook that Envision put out. Um, over the past year called selling the, the the business of design or the ROI of design or something like that. And what was really eye-opening there was it, it took what you said, Alex, um, and kind of told a whole story around it. We often as designers find ourselves like needing to pitch, needing to sell, needing to get people to see um, and think the way that that it is that that we think. But if we think about the fact that we're all about the user and ha, as you mentioned before, like we have to think like a researcher the hippos, um, the CEOs and whatnot, they're our audience, they're our user. And how can we understand their language? And how can we understand what's important to them? And then frame our designs to them or frame our language to, to them. And I thought that was really interesting. And talked about tips like, just listen to the way that they speak, listen to the words that they use. Um, how do they talk about business? We as designers have to show that we're also committed to the business. Um, that we're also committed to the goals. When we just come out and we say, hey, I have this crazy idea that's completely different than the goals that you set, that kind of shows them that we're not aligned uh, with their, their, their product vision. But when we can take into account what's important to them and then use our special design skills to bring those ideas up, it's gonna make for more collaborative um, and mutually aligned conversations all around. That's my take and two cents on it. But anyone else have anything to add to the question that we have from Nathan on um, how do you measure or prove the value of design to your founders? Um, are there specific metrics that, that help uh, with the impact of design? I could probably take that one. Um, that's a loaded question. Uh, one, one of the most important things you need to do initially is to when you start that conversation is to define what success means together with the founder or whoever your stakeholder is. Um, you might find that their measurement of success is a different goal or different motivation than what you originally thought. So for example, a founder or a stakeholder might measure success by sales but you might measure success by some behavior metric of the user, of what the user did or how the user engaged. So then that starts a conversation around like what outcome do you want to achieve versus like what feature. Um, but having that conversation will help you kind of uh, educate the, the stakeholder and balance, make that balance between um, some other business goal versus like the goal for the, learn for the user. Yeah, absolutely. Really great points, Hop. 
Um, we're going to keep moving down the, the questions now. We're in the, the final stretch here of, of the panel today, and we'll start um, going down the audience questions as they've been upvoted. So the next one comes in from Nancy, and her question is, what are some places or resources you think are great to find startups to work with, especially local ones? So, so how would somebody who's interested in this um, be able to follow um, openings and get these on their radar more easily? I guess it depends on um, your area. I've only ever really worked in startups in Philly um, and the surrounding suburbs. But um, for me, I, I found a lot of opportunities on LinkedIn. And I know LinkedIn isn't always the most relevant um, job forum or what have you for other positions, but I've, I've found it to be very successful for uh, job openings in UI, UX, traditional graphic design too. And again, speaking to some local organizations, I'm a fan of uh, Philly Startup Leaders, um, Philly Tech Week. Um, each of the universities, I mean, there's so many within uh, Philadelphia, um, Temple, Penn, Drexel, all of incubators um, and business centers and resources. And, you know, we think about joining startups and often it, it'd be wonderful if there were a, a startup job for everyone who wanted one. Um, but sometimes that doesn't mean there are full-time jobs. Sometimes it means that you can go in and consult or freelance or even just make the intro and offer a little bit of your service, not to work for free, but to start building those connections, um, which I think is like a, a nice inroads. And, you know, that kind of interpersonal networking is really where you find a lot of great opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, as you start to, as you find one startup, it'll just like blossom into all of them. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, for, for Neuroflow, for instance, I was um, just doing some freelance graph design for them on the side, you know, just like going home and making a couple one sheets. Um, and then I found myself genuinely interested in the product. And I was like, oh, maybe I want to uh, step this up a notch. And so that's, you know, exactly uh, what Alex is mentioning. Like you could reach out and just do some some side hustle work um, and you never know where where it will take you. Ha, uh, what about in your neck of the woods over there on the west coast? Uh, I know that there are startup events every year, but I've kind of gotten my enough of startups. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm like I'm kind of burnt out on startups lately, but we always have uh, startup organizations in San Diego all the time. But if you just, you know, go on LinkedIn, look for Startup San Diego, you'll find a ton of them. Yeah, I also vouch for, for, for LinkedIn as well. I feel, you know, even, even with there's, there's some, you know, common gripes and, and complaints about the actual product, um, I have seen a big improvement to their posting of, of job openings and they just seem to get a little smarter um, as well, especially the automated ones that kind of line up with people's backgrounds more often. But yes, you know, start there. Um, certainly have some people here that, that you can network with. And, and learn more about. And hopefully when the you know, world gets back to normal a little bit, we could start seeing some things um, like get togethers and um, community groups and, and whatnot where you could continue to, to learn more about that. But also your, your great hosts here at Philly Chi also have a, a lot of uh, very large network to, to tap into. The next question is a juicy one. And it comes from, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, Jaya. Working at a startup versus a large organization, does it have different impact on work-life balance? Just depends on the company. <laughs> I, I'd say yes. Um, you know, I, I find larger organizations, perhaps that, that schedule is a little bit more regular. Um, it's a little bit more nine to five, um, but working in startups, the flexibility tends to be a little bit higher. So you might work a longer day one day and a short day the other. You might have more flexibility to take more time off as you need it. Um, so it's kind of like different sides of the coin. Um, but, you know, I just encourage everyone, no matter uh, what kind of startup you're, you're looking to work in, you know, avoid signs of, uh, you know, burnout. Um, take care of yourself. Make sure you're, you establish that, like, the importance of taking that time outside of work to recharge. And that way you can bring your best self 
you know, come the next morning. Yeah, absolutely. That was something that was really important to me when I was interviewing with John at Sidecar. Um, and I, I was actually very happy at the agency that I was at. I wasn't looking for a position and, oh yeah. And they reached out to me on LinkedIn. There you go. Um, <laughs> and uh, I ended up um, looking it up and being really interested in it. And I wasn't able to get back to the city until I think it was probably like a six o'clock interview. And I was like, oh man, like the last startup I worked at, I was working until 2 a.m. in the morning. You know, I was like, I don't want to do a startup again. I don't think so. And then I show up and it's like John and maybe two other people. I was like, oh, oh, this is a good sign. <laughs> um, and I remember talking to John about that. And I was like, I'm, I do not shy away from hard work. In fact, that's that's what I want. Um, but I am a little nervous about a 90 hour work week. And he, I think he, I think you laughed at me, John. And I was like, oh, OK, great. <laughs> Um, so yeah, definitely like what Alex mentioned, uh, there, there is like a typical nine to five more so on a corporate side, but also what Ha mentioned, like it does depend on the startup that you work at. Like you could have a wonderful, totally wonderful work-life balance. And, um, and I definitely saw that at Sidecar for sure, you know? And yeah, and Ha, you, you mentioned earlier in one of your previous answers about uh, one of the, the most important things is to be hungry and, and to be scrappy, right? And that that does come hand in hand with this environment. It does change uh, from job to job, as you, you also answered uh, very, very briefly at the beginning here, that it, it depends on the company, it depends on the role. But I think it's important to remember that if you're coming into this environment, you're hungry enough and scrappy enough that if you have to put in some extra hours, you're okay doing that because it's what you want to do. If you're going to have a problem with that, then maybe you should reconsider um, the environment because it can be a little unpredictable. There can be a random day um, that you have to put in extra time. I think we'd certainly do see a trend in startups as well, or at least a trend that startups are influencing with work-life balance and trying to balance that out. Uh, we see a lot more startups with unlimited PTO, you know, take the time off that you need um, in order to be recharged and come in and do your best work. Flexible hours, you don't have to show up at 9 a.m. You don't have to come in on a set schedule. You can be flexible um, depending on your life needs as well. And, and startups that seems to be becoming more and more the norm from experience that I'm seeing, which may just you know lead to something that's super important to keep in mind when interviewing with startups is what kind of culture do they have? What kind of culture do they have around work-life balance? And how do they think about their people and care about their people? That should be a top core value of, of any startup that you join and something that they consider and put thought to prior. Next question is from Christine. Um, Kelsey, you made a great point about trying to step in and take away design from the founder or someone that's been very invested prior to you joining. Aside from just creating the design, what practices and principles do you suggest establishing so that a UX team and design can be set up to scale as the business grows? Yeah, that's a great question. That was that was definitely something, especially early on in my career at uh, Neuroflow, that I wish I would have taken into more account. Um, I mean, you should have seen like my desktop initially. I had like 5,000 different things scattered everywhere. And I was like, oh my God, this is, it's just so much. Um, so I would definitely suggest in order to help uh, a future team scale, um, you definitely want to create that design system. Um, it is work up front. And very oftentimes, like you're going to be a team of one and you're like, when am I going to do this? You will be so happy you did. <laughs> so I would definitely suggest doing that, even if it's not fully fleshed out, you know, just like start in. Um, I would definitely, definitely suggest that. I would suggest file naming conventions um, and uh, documentation on processes um, as you can. Um, I think that's really important. I mean, I like I mentioned earlier, I hired Nathan full-time about a month ago. And I realized how much stuff that a new employee would want to know. And I was like, oh, I should have recorded this. Um, and so, you know, I spent, I had to spend a lot of time documenting that stuff at that point. And um, I wish I would have done it while it was like fresh in my mind. And I, I the last thing I would mention is establishing um, uh, design review. So, um, you know, you, you want to establish that with your immediate team, certainly, you know, your uh, product managers, um, if you have them, <laughs> um, and your engineers. But I would um, also suggest wanting to um, uh, 
uh, loop in your stakeholders. So, uh, and determining at what point in the process that's most beneficial for you, your product, your company um, at that stage of the game. But I definitely think that's important because if you design in a black box and then you push it out and your CEO doesn't like it, like it's, it's, it doesn't reflect very positively. And so if you establish that, uh, you know, right in the beginning, um, it kind of just becomes the name of the game as the company grows. Okay, I think we have time for one more quick question here. Um, this one just came in, it doesn't have the most votes, but I'm going to ask it because I think it's kind of relevant to the uh, good seven so from the UX team of one. Um, this one comes in from Apurv. Uh, when do you know that it's time to hire the second designer and what's the best way to convince the company to do it? Um, so, <laughs> um, I knew that I needed a designer when I started to make sloppy, unusual mistakes for myself. Um, I started to miss certain, uh, you know, small edge cases that I typically would have been on top of. I started to, um, uh, you know, not totally give, have enough time to vet certain things. Um, and so it would get to engineering and they would be picking out all these little things. I'm like, you are totally right. Um, and uh, that was the time when I went to my, my product manager and I was like, look, I really, really need help <laughs> because at this point we're sacrificing um, the, uh, the, the product integrity and I don't want to do that. Um, and you know, if you establish yourself as, as a hard worker and you're clearly not a slacker um, at that, and, and you've been communicative along your journey of like, hey, it's getting a little harder. Okay, it's really hard. Okay, like I'm breaking now. Um, that that has, has been really helpful. <laughs> Another uh, indicator is if uh, your work-life balance is terrible, when consistently terrible. Absolutely. <laughs> And to chime in one last one, uh, when the ratio of designer to engineer makes it so um, uh, hard to do your do job because you spend more time answering questions and working yes. with engineers and being able to start working on the next batch of work that you'll be you know, queuing up. Um, so when that relationship becomes unmanageable and you can no longer handle that. Absolutely. That's a really good point. And yeah, I mean, convincing the company, uh, for me, all I had to do was literally be like, this is what I used to be able to get done. This is what I can get done now. This is what we're missing out on. And it was, it was like, oh, well then let's do it. Yeah. Alex, is there a, quickly, is there a typical designer engineer ratio um, that you've seen, seen work or that you might hear as industry standard? Uh, it, I think it really ranges. If you look at some of the FANG companies, right now, Grant, they're not startups, but you know, you see ratios of sometimes four to one or five to one um, in the most ideal situation. Um, you know, it, I think it really depends on also the, the kind of mix of engineering that's happening and the kind of uh, you know uh, how many engineers need a product designer input to be able to successfully complete their jobs. So if you have a lot of architects working on backend that don't necessarily need as much um, guidance or help or support from design, that kind of changes the ratio. Um, but John, if you're looking for me to give you an answer to get us to hire more designers, I can do that. So. <laughs> Good little twist. Well, cool. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I appreciate all, all three of you really share, taking, not only taking the time, but to share um, all these excellent insights that you've had. Um, you really painted a great picture of what it's like to be a UX designer in a startup at all different sizes and, and stages. And I appreciate everyone who, who joined today um, and listened in and gave us, gave us their time and spent that extra time on Zoom um, at the end of the day, because we all know how much time we're spending on it throughout the day now, and it, it's not easy to, to stick around. And, and thank you so much for all the extra um, questions that you've all shared and the engagement throughout. We really, really appreciate you all. And now we will hand it back over to the fine Philly Kai folks. Thanks so much, John. Uh, 
I think I'm, I'm taking this away so we can give away some raffle prizes and some swag from Guru. Um, first, just thanks to the panel. I, I personally took a lot away from this as sort of a UX team of one at my job. So thanks so much for all the awesome perspective and tips and attendees who have stuck it out. Please share your kudos and virtual claps in the chat. It's one of the, the things we don't get in these virtual events is you don't get to hear the, the applause afterwards, but I'm sure there would be a lot of it. All right. So the raffle winners for our first book, which is Writing is Designing. The winner is Rachel Campbell. I see you in the, the attendee list. And Christine's sort of holding up the book. It's, it's kind of showing up. Congrats, Rachel. The second book is appropriately UX Team of One. And that is going to Tyler Diaz. Congrats, Tyler. Third book, Build Better Products. These are all from Rosenfeld Media, who is one of our proud sponsors. That third book is going to someone who's not here anymore. Let's see about a backup. All right, Jessica Angeline, congratulations. Very nice. All right, Chong, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, I will wrap it up. Awesome. Thank you for it off. Well, okay, so let's, um, it's 8, eight um, o'clock now. Well, thank you everyone for joining tonight. I hope you all enjoy the um, that amount of story and of knowledge that that all four panelists and John pulled out for you today. Um, hope you learn as much as we do, and it's, it's really the reason why we we doing we are doing this is sharing knowledge and and so we can grow and learn from each other and connect it. Um, as I've been saying all the time, and I'm going to repeat it again, we appreciate your time and stay safe, stay healthy, and stay connected. All right. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. See you, everyone. Bye.